Welcome back to Tomorrow Space News. Today, we've got another lunar adventure that's hot off the launch pad. On February 26, 2025, SpaceX launched a Falcon 9 rocket sending Intuitive Machine's second lunar lander, IM-2 Athena, on its way to the moon. But this mission isn't alone. There's three hitchhiker spacecraft that are also along for the ride, and we're gonna learn about all of them. So let's dive in. The star of the show is, of course, the Athena lander by Intuitive Machines. We did a good rundown last week about the payloads on board, including a mini lunar lander, Grace Hopper, and three mini rovers, which will work together to collect lunar science and communicate with each other using a Nokia 4G network. Check out our summary video to learn more about these vehicles and the science that they hope to accomplish. What I'd like to highlight today is the other spacecraft that were launched on this rideshare mission. Aside from the Athena lander, the other members of this carpool are NASA's Lunar Trailblazer spacecraft, which will hunt for lunar ice, Astroforge's Odin spacecraft, which will attempt to fly by a near-Earth asteroid, and finally, we have a space tug called Chimera, which is built by Epic Aerospace, a company from Argentina, which is taking the long but scenic route to eventually deploy CubeSats into geostationary orbit. Let's focus on NASA's Lunar Trailblazer first. Lunar Trailblazer was selected in 2019 and initially was going to be built by Ball Aerospace, but instead, Lockheed Martin took over over construction of the spacecraft. Lunar Trailblazer's core mission is to create a detailed global map of water on the moon, specifically water ice, as well as hydrated minerals and hydroxyl compounds down to a resolution that's finer than any previous mission before it. It's not just about finding ice, it's about understanding its form, its abundance, and its accessibility. Why? because water is the ultimate lunar game changer. It can be split into hydrogen and oxygen for rocket fuel or breathable air, and even for industrial processes. But wait a minute, didn't we already discover and map lunar ice? Well, kinda. NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, or LRO for short, and other missions have mapped lunar ice, but their efforts left gaps that Trailblazer aims to fill. LRO confirmed that ice does exist, especially in the South Pole's craters, with estimates of 5 to 10 percent ice in some spots. But its resolution is kilometers wide and uses indirect methods like reflectivity, not direct water detection, which means that it's more of a broad sketch than a detailed blueprint. So yes, we do have a general map, but not a GPS-level guide. Ice could be patchy within craters, 10% here, none there, and we don't know the micro-scale distribution of that ice. So, Lunar Trailblazer is equipped with two key instruments. A shortwave infrared spectrometer that detects the water's spectral signatures that scales as small as 100 meters per pixel across the entire lunar surface. And it also has a thermal imager that measures surface temperatures at 50 meters per pixel, sniffing out ice in permanently shadowed regions by how cold they stay. This instrument combo lets Trailblazer see water in ways that other spacecraft couldn't, pinpointing its exact locations, concentrations, and its physical state. Is it ice or is it bound inside of minerals? And it can do that day and night across all latitudes of the moon. That being said, it's going to be a little while before we get that detailed map. Lunar Trailblazer is going to take approximately four months to reach lunar orbit, arriving around late June in 2025. Hang on a minute, I thought Athena was going to get to the moon in seven days. Well, for Trailblazer, it's using a low-energy flyby transfer to loop around a couple of times before it enters lunar orbit in an effort to preserve fuel so that Trailblazer can complete its mission and control itself long enough to get a full map of the moon. The total mission, including the cruise phase and the science phases, is planned for about two years in total. So, by the end of 2027, we should have all of that data it's hoping to find and have a much better plan on where we want to start building a moon base that has the easiest and the most access to water on the moon. This is all really exciting stuff, but let's move on because we have some more hitchhikers to talk about. Astroforge is a new company that aims to mine asteroids for rare earth metals. 
They are being very scrappy and trying to launch low-cost missions to verify if some near-Earth asteroids around us would be good targets for mining. Their spacecraft, Odin, is heading beyond the moon to scout asteroid 2022 OB5. What a name. It's a small, potentially metal-rich near-Earth asteroid, and their goal is to fly by that asteroid, snap some high-resolution black-and-white photos from about a kilometer away, or about a half a mile, and beam back that data on its density and its composition to prep for a future landing mission called Vestry. Even if that particular asteroid turns out to be a rubble dust pile with no value, this is the first time that any of the asteroid mining companies are actually sending a spacecraft to do a flyby mission like this. So it's going to verify a lot in terms of the engineering and experience needed to conduct low-cost asteroid hunting missions like this. Odin's going to slingshot around the moon and then take about 300 days to reach that target asteroid, aiming for a flyby around January of 2026 when the asteroid is closest to Earth at around 400,000 miles or 650,000 kilometers away. Just far enough, but close enough for a decent uh, transfer of data. Here's a couple of quick facts about Odin that I'm super impressed by. The spacecraft was developed in just 10 months. They only started building it last year, and the first parts that they initially had subcontracted out failed several tests. So they had to start over from scratch and quickly build a replacement, and that replacement thankfully passed all of the pre-launch testing. This may be the fastest spacecraft development in history, and they claim it was only an estimated cost of $6.5 million, which is a steal compared to most spacecraft. Although it is just a scout, if they succeed, we're gonna see many more missions like this, and more advanced landers, and eventually miners. That being said, as of the recording of this video, they are having some communications problems. The Deep Space Network is currently being used for the Athena Lander and for Lunar Trailblazer. So Astroforge is working with commercial satellite trackers to communicate with the spacecraft instead. So far, they've only gotten a few pings and not a full acquisition of signal, meaning that they can't command the spacecraft to maneuver yet. And if they don't get in touch soon, the mission could be over before it starts. The spacecraft is healthy though, and is generating power with its own solar panels. But even in the worst case scenario, I'm still super impressed that they had developed the spacecraft so quickly, and no doubt are going to learn a bunch of lessons regardless of what the outcome is. Finally, let's talk about the last hitchhiker on this mission, Chimera Geo, which is built by the Argentinian company Epic Aerospace. This is a space tug that's meant to deliver smaller spacecraft or instruments to higher orbits than whatever rocket initially launched them into space. Chimera Geo has a payload deployer by ExoLaunch, and based on the size of that box, it has one to four CubeSats inside that are going to be deployed in geostationary orbit. The CubeSats identity and final orbital slot remain undisclosed, but the goal is clear get it to geostationary orbit, and release it. As a matter of fact, many details about this Chimera mission haven't been released. It is on the same trajectory as all the rest of the spacecraft headed towards the moon right now, and it is going to fall back towards Earth after a lunar flyby, as will the upper stage of the Falcon 9 rocket. But from there, the spacecraft should be able to use its engine to aim for a geostationary orbit and circularize after a few orbits, or maybe even all at once in one really long burn. I'm honestly unsure at this point. So it could be as short as a couple of weeks or as long as a couple of months before this Chimera space tug reaches its intended orbit and releases its mystery CubeSats. And the one update that we have gotten so far is that Epic Aerospace is in contact with their Chimera Geo spacecraft. So they should be able to issue all the different commands so that they can do the different orbital burns to accomplish its mission. These are all ambitious projects, and I think that everyone is excited and hopeful for at least the lunar landers to be successful. If Athena lands successfully around March 6th of 2025, it's gonna be a great accomplishment. 
But don't forget about Firefly's Blue Ghost Lander, which is in lunar orbit right now and returned a beautiful video about 60 miles or 100 kilometers from the lunar surface. Blue Ghost is going to be attempting its landing this Sunday on March 2nd, starting around 12.20 a.m. Pacific Standard Time or 3.20 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And Firefly will be doing a joint live stream with NASA. So we should have a lot to talk about this Sunday during our own weekly live stream at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time or 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We should know by then whether or not Firefly landed successfully. All of us at Tomorrow are wishing the best of luck to Firefly, Intuitive Machines, as well as NASA, Astroforge, and Epic Aerospace for their missions. This is certainly a very exciting time to be alive and witness history being made. This is just the beginning, and based on how all these missions play out, are either going to make or break support for the Artemis program. And who knows? Maybe if Artemis is canceled, these types of missions will still continue with the ambitions of the Artemis Accord signers. The European Space Agency and the Japanese Space Agency won't give up the moon so easily, even if the United States does. However, I'm pretty confident that American lawmakers will want to continue the lunar program, especially if these low-cost missions succeed and give us better data about where we should be landing and building a lunar base. In any case, thank you very much for watching this video. Be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the bell so that you're notified whenever we upload another Space News update. Until next time, keep moving onwards and upwards, everybody, and don't forget, Ad Astra, to the stars.